Greetings, I am Abraham Lincoln, and I am eager to unveil my tale to you. I was born on February 12, 1809, in a one-room log cabin at Sinking Spring Farm near Hodgenville, Kentucky. My father, Thomas Lincoln, was a skilled carpenter and farmer. Although he was illiterate like most pioneer frontiersmen, he earned the respect of his community for his honesty and church attendance. He traced his ancestry back to a weaver's apprentice from Hingham, Norfolk, England, who migrated to Massachusetts in 1637. My mother, Nancy Hanks, is a somewhat mysterious figure, believed to have been born out of wedlock and coming from a line of modest Virginia farmers. My parents had three children, Sarah, myself, Abraham, and Thomas, who sadly died in infancy. In the autumn of 1818, when I was just nine years old, my mother Nancy passed away. Thomas Lincoln and Nancy Hanks were married on June 12, 1806, in Washington County, and the family later moved to Elizabethtown, Kentucky. There, my father leased or bought farms, but due to unfortunate circumstances, he lost all but 200 acres of his property. Indiana was a free territory where the rules regarding property ownership were more reliable. My father, a member of the separate Baptist church, opposed slavery on religious and moral grounds, and I shared his views. I have been opposed to the practice of slavery for as long as I can remember. As I grew up, I developed some resentment towards my father's intellectual limitations. When I turned 21, I left my father's world and never saw him again. As I gained prominence in politics, I became somewhat embarrassed about my frontier origins and rarely spoke publicly about my youth and upbringing. Life in Indiana was challenging for us. We lived in a remote forest in Hurricane Township, Perry County, and had to rely on hunting for food. The hardships we faced worsened after my mother's death. To help the family, my father married Sarah Sally Bush Johnston in December 1819. She was a widow with three children of her own, and she became a caring and loving mother figure to me. When she passed away in January 1828, giving birth to a stillborn son, I was devastated. From a young age, I had a love for reading. I preferred intellectual pursuits over the physical labor involved in farming, despite my tall stature. By the age of 15, I had received sporadic education for a total of one year, as attending school regularly was difficult due to my farm responsibilities and our remote location. However, my limited education was enough to teach myself through reading whatever books I could find. In 1830, I helped my family move to Illinois, where I would spend most of my adult years. In July 1831, I left my family for the final time and settled in New Salem. Impressed by my intellect and speaking skills, several residents of New Salem, including the president of the local debating club, suggested that I run for the Illinois state legislature. I announced my candidacy in March 1832, demonstrating my supreme self-confidence. Despite my lack of formal education, government experience, and limited recognition outside of my small community, I ran independently for the state legislature. Unfortunately, I lost the election on August 6, 1832. It was the only time in my life that I was beaten in a direct vote of the people. Over the next two years, I held various jobs, including serving as a militia captain in the Black Hawk War and working as the postmaster for New Salem. I continued to read extensively during this time, focusing on poetry and grammar. In 1834, I ran again for the Illinois State Legislature and won the election on August 4. Although not very active during my first term, I made political connections and became acquainted with Stephen Arnold Douglas, who would later become my rival. It was during this time that I decided to pursue a career in law. In March 1836, I was admitted to the practice of law. 
In April 1837, after leading a bill to move the capital of Illinois to Springfield, I moved there and opened a law office in partnership with a senior lawyer. In November of that year, the brutal murder of Elijah Lovejoy, the editor of an abolitionist newspaper, highlighted the growing tensions over slavery in the United States. I became increasingly involved in Illinois politics, leading the Whig Party and opposing the Democratic Party's plans to destroy the State Bank of Illinois. In 1841, I was offered a partnership with Stephen Logan, a prominent lawyer in Illinois. Under his guidance, my legal career flourished, and I was able to earn a comfortable living for the first time in my life. In the previous year, I had become engaged to Mary Todd, the daughter of a wealthy Kentucky merchant and slave owner. Despite my initial concerns about readiness for marriage, we married on November 4, 1842. We had four children, Robert, Eddie, Willie, and Tad. Unfortunately, both Eddie and Willie died in childhood, and Tad passed away from heart failure at the age of 18. These losses deeply affected both Mary and me, and I struggled with melancholy, or what is now known as clinical depression. I was temporarily admitted to a mental asylum later in my life by my remaining child, Robert, in 1875. Once married, my law career went from strength to strength as I entered a new partnership where I was the senior member and began to appear frequently in cases before the Illinois Supreme Court. Moreover, I also continued to involve myself in Whig politics and made an unsuccessful run for the Whig nomination to the Whig nomination to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1843. However, I ran again in 1846 and obtained the nomination, eventually defeating my Democratic opponent in the election for the Illinois 7th District on August 3rd, with an unprecedented majority, I had forged a successful political and legal career, using my love for reading and learning to lift myself from the physical toil of my youth and enter the intellectual professional world I had always aspired to be a part of. So on October 25, 1847, I set off for Washington and entered Congress shortly after the United States declared war against Mexico. The background to the Troubles began in 1840 when Texas revolted against Mexico and secured a treaty that granted territory to an independent Texan republic. However, when Mexico repudiated this treaty, hostilities resumed and Texas applied for admission to the Union with a boundary line still in dispute. This war became controversial as it became intertwined with a dominant issue in American politics at the time the expansion of slavery into the newly admitted states. The debate focused not only on the morality of slavery, but also on the balance of power between free and slave states in America. It aimed to maintain a balance in congressional representation between these states. In 1820, the Missouri Compromise was established, prohibiting slavery in territories west of the Mississippi and north of the 36-30 parallel, with the exception of Missouri. It was intended as a temporary solution to suppress the intense debates on the extension of slavery to the West and the balance of power in Congress. However, as I entered Congress 27 years later, these debates were re-emerging with great intensity. Alongside abolitionists and the majority of my Whig party, I viewed the war with Mexico and Texas's admission to the Union with suspicion. The territory gained by Texas from Mexico would be divided into states, all allowing slavery south of the Missouri line. I spoke out against the war in Congress, primarily for political reasons, denouncing President Polk's warmongering actions to boost the Whig prospects in the upcoming election. As my term in Congress was only two years and I had promised not to seek a second term, it had little impact on my reputation and stature. So when my term ended, I returned to Springfield fully determined to focus on my legal career and it seemed that my life of public service was over. From 1849 to 1854, I dedicated myself entirely to the legal profession, touring the judicial circuits for six months each year. 
However, in 1854, I was awakened from my political slumber by the passage of a law that would ignite the nation and fuel a divisive issue that had been stirring tensions in the country for decades. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, proposed by my long-term political rival, Illinois Democrat Stephen Douglas, aimed to allow settlers in new territories to decide through popular vote whether slavery would be permitted. This proposal would repeal the cherished Missouri Compromise of 1820, which the free states held dear. This proposal would repeal the cherished Missouri Compromise of 1820, which the free states held dear. With every problem that came before me, I never lost sight of this fundamental premise and was provoked back into political action. I campaigned fiercely against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, engaging in a series of debates with Senator Douglas, who had defended the Dred Scott decision. These debates, known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates, attracted large audiences and reflected the political divisions tearing the nation apart. Although I ultimately lost the Senate race, my Republicans gained substantial votes, and I gained a national reputation for my eloquent opposition to the expansion of slavery. Despite the sting of defeat, I did not retire from politics as I had no intention of doing so. I set my eyes on the presidential election of 1860, where the increasingly popular Republican Party needed a leader to lead them into the election. In late 1859 and early 1860, I made efforts to expand my reputation in the eastern states. I published a book of the Lincoln, Douglas Debates, which quickly became a bestseller. In February 1860, I was invited to speak to a Republican Union in New York, where I delivered one of my most memorable addresses. The speech captivated the crowd and received acclaim from major New York newspapers. I then traveled to New England, speaking and gaining Republican allies outside of my home state of Illinois. On May 16, 1860 Republican delegates gathered in Chicago for the Republican National Convention. After a narrow contest, I was nominated as the presidential candidate, edging out Senator William Seward of New York, who would later become my Secretary of State. Despite Seward's greater recognition and experience, it was believed that my less radical views on slavery made me better positioned to carry swing states where voters opposed slavery but also disliked abolitionism. I firmly opposed the expansion of slavery into the Western territories but did not advocate for abolishing it where it already existed. Around the same time, the Democratic Convention was held in Charleston, South Carolina, on April 23. Severe divisions emerged between Northern Democrats supporting Senator Stephen Douglas and Southern Douglas and Southern Democrats, who were angered by Douglas's remarks during his 1858 Senate campaign. These remarks suggested that people in the Western territories could vote to exclude slavery from the new states. The convention failed to reach a consensus, and a second convention held in Baltimore resulted in a split within the Democratic Party. The Northern Wing nominated Douglas, while the Southern Wing nominated John Breckinridge of Kentucky on a strongly pro-slavery platform. Meanwhile, based on advice from Republicans, I ran a campaign from home responding to numerous letters and addressing false rumors about my record. With the Democratic Party divided, a Republican victory seemed likely. Indeed, on the night of November 6, 1860, I was elected as the 16th President of the United States. Although I received less than 40 of the popular vote, I secured 180 out of 303 Electoral College votes. While elated by my victory, I recognized some concerning signs from the election results. In ten states, not a single ballot was cast in my favor. It was in these southern states where strong defenders of slavery resided that threats of secession had arisen. Throughout the election campaign, I had viewed these threats as mere political rhetoric. However, as I prepared to move to Washington, South Carolina was already taking concrete steps towards secession, which would eventually tear the United States apart. 
The process of secession began on November 10, when South Carolina authorized the election of a state convention to consider the state's future relationship with the Union. Within a month, every state in the Deep South had followed suit. I had underestimated the strength of secessionist sentiment among the cotton-growing states, which saw their right to practice slavery as being severely threatened by the newly formed Republican Party. South Carolina voted overwhelmingly in favor of secession, and on December 20, 1860, the state officially declared its withdrawal from the Union. The wave of secession then spread through the South. By February 1861, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Georgia, and Louisiana had joined South Carolina in forming the Confederate States of America. Jefferson Davis, a senator from Mississippi, was appointed as the president of the Confederacy. The secessionist movement was not a sudden response to the presidential election, but rather the culmination of growing estrangement between the North and the South over decades. The Southern economy remained agrarian and its society was rural and hierarchical, while the North industrialized and experienced urban growth. When I delivered my inaugural address on March 4, 1861, I appealed to the nation's better nature, emphasizing that we were not enemies but friends. I urged for reconciliation, stating that although passion may have strained, it must not break the bonds of affection that held the country together. I acknowledge the challenges I faced as an inexperienced and initially unpopular president assuming office during an unprecedented crisis. Even members of my cabinet, including Secretary of State William Seward, were daunted by the difficulties we confronted. I entered the White House firmly believing that the preservation of the Union was of utmost importance. The most urgent issue at the time was Fort Sumter, where Major Robert Anderson and his Union Army were stationed. Situated in Charleston Harbor and surrounded by Confederate batteries, I was reluctant to withdraw the Army and compromise Union prestige. However, sending reinforcements into the hostile harbor was not an option. On April 12, 1861, Confederate batteries began bombarding Fort Sumter. After 34 hours, Major Anderson's garrison surrendered, marking the beginning of the American Civil War. On April 15, I called for states to supply a militia of 75,000 men, and this call received widespread approval across the North as nationalist sentiment fueled support for war against the Confederacy. However, this request for troops disenchanted the upper southern states, including North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas. On April 17, they decided to secede from the Union, with the Confederacy subsequently relocating its capital to Richmond, Virginia. The following day, I offered the command of the Union armies to Colonel Robert Edward Lee, a Virginian. Lee declined, stating that he could not bear arms against his native state. Growing more confident in my position, I took additional steps to prepare the Union for war. On April 19, I declared a blockade of Confederate ports and expanded the Union armies and navies. In my address to Congress on July 4, I outlined my view of the conflict. I saw it not as a war between two states, which would acknowledge the Confederacy's legitimacy, but rather as a rebellion and insurrection, but rather as a rebellion and insurrection by individuals in the southern states who had betrayed the Union. Meanwhile, there was growing demand in the North for an advance on Richmond, the Confederate capital. Yielding to this pressure, I authorized a force of 28,000 to leave Washington on July 16 and march into Virginia. The first battle of Bull Run, or Manassas as it is known in the South, resulted in a Union defeat, with our soldiers retreating all the way back to the capital. This defeat severely impacted Union morale prompting me to immediately order General George McClellan, a West Point graduate, to come to Washington and take command of the newly formed Army of the Potomac. My hope was that McClellan would instill organization and discipline into the young Union Army volunteers. To my satisfaction, McClellan appeared to be the ideal candidate for the role and transformed the inexperienced recruits into a disciplined fighting force. 
He rigorously trained his troops and closely monitored their progress and well-being. McClellan gained the admiration of his soldiers more than any other Union commander throughout the war. However, public opinion eventually turned against him as it became apparent that he was hesitant to employ the Army of the Potomac that he had so skillfully crafted. This summer turned to autumn despite having a superior force compared to the Confederate Army at Manassas. McClellan's troops remained frustratingly stagnant. This drew the anger of Congress. My attention shifted from the capital to the Atlantic where on November 8th, an American warship intercepted the English steamer Trent and forcibly removed two Confederate diplomats. Initially, this act received applause from the public and myself. However, I soon realized that Britain was outraged by this violation of international maritime law, and there was even talk of a potential Anglo-American conflict. With great reluctance, on December 26, my cabinet and I agreed to release the Confederate prisoners to appease the British. Although this decision disappointed many in the North, it prevented the escalation of the American Civil War into an international conflict. The winter of 1861-1862 was a challenging period for me and my administration. Congress and the public grew increasingly frustrated with McClellan's inaction as he kept his large and costly army idle on the Potomac, failing to launch the autumn campaign he had promised months earlier. In January 1862, I addressed my general, stating, if General McClellan does not wish to use the army, I would like to borrow it. My frustration became evident to all when I issued a general war order, commanding all Union forces to make a general advance by February 22 and threatening to hold commanders accountable for carrying out the order. Although the February 22 deadline passed without a general advance, I found solace in Union victories in the West. The routing of Confederate forces in the Battle of Mill Springs in Kentucky on January 19 brought cheer Hiram, Ulysses Grant. Grant captured Fort Henry and Fort Donelson on the Tennessee River in early February, and with the Confederates abandoning Kentucky and most of Tennessee, a Union force occupied Nashville on February 15. However, the positive news from the West was overshadowed by the devastating tragedy in my household. On February 20, my third son, William, passed away after falling ill with typhoid fever. The loss of my son weighed heavily on me, and I mourned for days, finding solace in religion. Mary Lincoln, too, experienced immense grief and devastation. She took to her bed for three weeks upon hearing the news and continued to mourn her son for months to come. General McClellan, finally preparing to move his Army of the Potomac, insisted on his plan to capture Richmond, the Confederate capital, from the east. Despite my arguments for an assault on the Confederate Army at Manassas, McClellan had little respect for me or the concept that civilian authorities should hold more power than the military in a democratic society. He remained committed to his plan for Richmond. When McClellan's army finally took the field in early May, he continued to test my patience. He mistakenly believed that the Confederates outnumbered him and constantly requested more reinforcements from Washington. In Congress, I lacked allies, and many European nations were considering recognizing the Confederacy due to cotton shortages causing unemployment in Europe. I needed a victory to strengthen support at home and convince European nations that the Confederate states were a rebellious faction that would soon be suppressed by the United States government. However, McClellan's Peninsular Campaign turned out to be a notable failure. His indecision and unwarranted belief in Confederate superiority placed him out of his depth against the military genius of Confederate commander Robert Edward Lee. Lee launched a series of determined attacks during the Seven Days Battles from June 25 to July 1, driving the Union away from Richmond. While military matters consumed much of my time and energy, I never forgot the central issue that caused the war. In June and July of 1862, I began privately drafting an emancipation order. McClellan's defeats, the growing anti-slavery sentiment in the North, 
The frustration in Congress and the near mutinous state of the Army's officers convinced me that we needed a change in tactics. On July 22, I presented my cabinet with the first draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, a document that would grant freedom to all slaves within rebellious states to take effect on January 1, 1863. Although largely approved by my cabinet, I heeded the advice of Senator William Seward, my Secretary of State, who suggested that issuing the proclamation after a string of military setbacks would make the government appear desperate. Therefore, I decided to set the proclamation aside until after a victory. Unfortunately, victory remained elusive, and I came to the realization that McClellan would never initiate an attack as his massive army remained stationary on the peninsula. Requests for reinforcements persisted. I informed General Halleck, who had overall command of the Union armies, that he was free to keep or remove McClellan as he saw fit. In the meantime, due to my lack of faith in the Army of the Potomac, I organized a second Union force under General John Pope. In August 1862, Pope advanced on Robert Edward Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. At the Second Battle of Bull Run, or Second Manassas, from August 28 to 29, the Confederate forces secured another victory, driving the Union forces from eastern Virginia. During this time, I experienced episodes of depression or melancholy, as I often did throughout my life. My plan to defeat General Lee's army and capture Richmond had failed utterly. With Pope's defeat, I was unable to issue my Emancipation Proclamation. To make matters worse, Lee did not rest on his laurels after his great victory. He launched an invasion of Maryland, spreading fear throughout the North as his army advanced. I seriously contemplated scrapping the proposed Emancipation Proclamation, believing that the Union now needed to fight a defensive war with a defensive policy on slavery. And I was encouraged in these thoughts by congressional moderates. However, I decided to entrust the matter to Providence instead. I told my cabinet that if God granted us victory in the upcoming battle, I would see it as a sign of divine will and move forward in the cause of emancipation. That sign arrived on September 17 at the Battle of Antietam, the single bloodiest day of the war. Although it was not the overwhelming victory I had hoped for, the Confederate invasion was halted and General Lee was forced to retreat back into Virginia. On September 22, my cabinet and I agreed to officially publish the Emancipation Proclamation. Instead of decrying the immorality of slavery, the document cleverly presented my action as a military necessity to preserve the Union. Regardless of the motive or wording of the proclamation, its final line stated that on January 1, 1863, all slaves in states rebelling against the United States would be forever free. While abolitionists celebrated the proclamation and praised me, the decree faced mostly hostile reception. Southern Confederates and Unionists, as well as Northern Democrats and moderate Republicans, denounced the measure. They believed that my actions would undermine the loyalty of the border states that remained faithful to the Union. Even many abolitionists, after their initial excitement, grew disenchanted with the proclamation because it did not abolish slavery in states that had not seceded, such as Kentucky and Maryland. Meanwhile, General McClellan stagnated once again, failing to pursue Lee's wounded army and allowing it to escape back across the Potomac without resistance. When McClellan eventually began his pursuit, the army moved at a sluggish pace, taking nine days to cross the Potomac River. At this point, I had reached my breaking point. On November 5, I removed McClellan from his command and replaced him with General Ambrose Burnside, a 38-year-old West Point graduate. However, Burnside lacked confidence in his ability to command such a large army, and his doubts proved valid when the Union Army suffered a disastrous defeat at Fredericksburg on December 11. They engaged in a frontal assault against heavily fortified Confederate positions and sustained 13,000 casualties. Recognizing that Burnside's failure had caused a loss of confidence in the government among officers and troops, I relieved him of his command on January 25, 1863, 
and appointed General Joseph Hooker, nicknamed Fighting Joe, as his replacement. Amidst the ongoing military challenges I faced, a significant day in my presidency arrived on New Year's Day, 1863, when I signed the Emancipation Proclamation into law. Although I had wrestled with self-doubt over the decree since its conception in the summer of 1862, I declared I never in my life felt more certain that I was doing right than I do in signing this paper. The final proclamation not only declared the slaves in the South free, but also allowed for the acceptance of former slaves into the Union's armed forces. As a result, black regiments began to form, marking a historic moment in the American Army's history. I actively encouraged the recruitment of African American soldiers, believing they would be the Union's decisive weapon against the Confederacy. However, General Hooker's bold plan to attack the Confederate rear at Chancellorsville in early May ended in defeat due to the military genius of General Lee and Stonewall Jackson, buoyed by the seeming invincibility of the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee launched a second invasion of the North, leaving me distraught. When I received news of the defeat at Chancellorsville, I exclaimed, My God, what will the country say? My administration began facing intense criticism from Congress and public opinion as the failures and incompetence of the United States war effort were associated with my presidency. Moreover, there were divisions within my cabinet, and northern newspapers painted a picture of an administration plagued by division and discord. The anger toward my administration intensified with the passage of the Conscription Act in March 1863, which made all able-bodied men between the ages of 20 and 45 subject to a call for national service. Many denounced it as tyrannical. This tension manifested in the violent draft riots in July 1863 in New York City, where anger towards the conscription law and my administration led to four days of bloody protests. To regain public trust and support, I published a letter on June 12, defending the administration's curtailment of freedoms as necessary for the greater goal of preserving the Union. And with the letter receiving widespread approval from politicians in the press, I was able to somewhat relieve the immense pressure on my administration. Therefore, upon withdrawing Hooker from command, I ignored the calls for McClellan's reinstatement and instead replaced Fighting Joe, whose consistent refusal to obey commands had infuriated me with the experienced George Meade. As June turned into July in 1863, the fate of the United States hung in the balance. The Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia were approaching the bloodiest battle in American history near a small town in southern Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, in the West, General Grant had won a series of engagements along the Mississippi River and had a Confederate army under siege in the strategically important town of Vicksburg. At this point, the weight of the war began to take a toll on me, and my health deteriorated due to anxiety. On July 4, exactly 80, seven years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, I received the long-awaited news that the Union had defeated Lee's army in the Battle of Gettysburg and the Confederates were retreating. Just three days later, a report reached the White House announcing the fall of Vicksburg, with the Union capturing a rebel army of 30,000 men and gaining control of the Mississippi River, I was overjoyed. However, this joy soon turned to anger when Meade's army failed to pursue and destroy Lee's shattered force. I expressed my frustration, stating, Our army held the war in the hollow of their hand, and they would not close it. I was beside myself with anger and although I would later praise Meade for his great victory, I felt that the opportunity to end the war had slipped away from the Union. During the summer of 1863, I felt the need to convey to my fellow Americans the larger significance of the war and what the men were truly fighting and dying for. With the victories at Vicksburg and Gettysburg, it seemed that the end of the conflict was within reach and my opportunity came on November 19 when I was asked to deliver a speech at the dedication of a cemetery at the site of the Great Battle of Gettysburg. 
The address I delivered that day is remembered as perhaps the most famous piece of oratory in American history. In just 272 words, I evoked the past, the present, and the future of the nation, expanding the significance of the war from the restoration of the Union to the extension of equality and the fulfillment of the principles espoused by the Declaration of Independence for all Americans. I opened my speech by reminding the audience that 87 years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I further asserted that the soldiers who fell should not have done so in vain, and it was the duty of all to ensure that this was the case. I concluded with words that would resonate through time, stating, This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. In late 1863, both the I and Congress began considering plans for the terms on which the southern states would be allowed to re-enter the Union. While there were divisions between radicals and moderates, with the former demanding drastic social and economic reorganization in the South to ensure complete equality for African Americans, I managed to satisfy both factions with my plans. I proposed maintaining the territorial integrity and legal structures of the South while making complete emancipation a requirement for re-entry into the Union. This remarkable political dexterity allowed me to please both factions of my Republican Party, as well as the Northern public. On March 8, 1864, frustrated by the inaction of Medid on the East Coast and unimpressed by the successes of the Union's Western armies, I bestowed the rank of Lieutenant General upon Grant, a rank previously achieved only by George Washington and Winfield Scott. I ordered him to take command of the Union armies. Ulysses S. Grant was highly popular in the North, and his appointment also yielded political benefits, as I had eliminated a potential rival in the upcoming presidential contest. In Grant, I had finally found a direct and trustworthy commander whom I liked and trusted. With my suggestions and guidance, Grant developed a strategy of simultaneous massive attacks on the Confederate heartlands, a sharp break from the maneuvering of previous generals. While Grant's Army of the Potomac began to advance against Lee's forces on May 4, three days later, General William Tecumseh Sherman launched his campaign in the West to capture Atlanta. And so, with my approval, Grant led his army against the Confederates, enduring significant losses of 32,000 men in two weeks, yet persistently pressing Lee's army. Meanwhile, from June 7th to 8th, 1864, the Republican Convention convened in Baltimore and unanimously nominated me as their presidential candidate for the upcoming November election. Additionally, following my suggestion, the convention declared support for the creation of a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery throughout the entire nation. Despite this achievement, the summer of 1864 proved immensely challenging for me. Union campaigns were faltering and casualties were rapidly mounting. I couldn't shake the deep sense of responsibility for the bloodshed. As the relentless conflict dragged on with no apparent end, my prospects for re-election seemed bleak. In fact, by late August, I was convinced that defeat was imminent. However, the situation swiftly changed when the Democratic Party nominated General McClellan as their presidential candidate in the last days of August, advocating for an end to the war. Nevertheless, this platform was widely despised as a surrender and a betrayal of the Union cause. My prospects received a further boost on September 4th, when news reached Washington of General Sherman's capture of the vital Confederate stronghold of Atlanta. Consequently, on November 8th, I was re-elected with a resounding majority of the Electoral College votes. McClellan only managed to win three states. The result was celebrated as a great victory for the Union and the abolitionist cause. With my success, Confederate politicians realized the inevitable defeat of the Southern Rebellion. This defeat appeared imminent as Sherman embarked on a devastating march through Georgia, ultimately capturing the city of Savannah on December 25th.
Shortly thereafter, on April 11th, I delivered my final public speech from the White House, outlining my plans for the nation's reconstruction. I announced moderate proposals to restore the Union, eradicate slavery, and offered amnesty to those resisting national authority. I also allowed the immediate readmission of politicians from the seceded states into the national legislature. Personally, I made efforts to persuade wavering politicians. On January 31st, the House passed the amendment and submitted it to the states for ratification. I hailed this amendment as the remedy for the root cause of the Civil War, recognizing that if the South rejoined the Union before the amendment's ratification, it might never be passed. Desires for peace were growing on both sides. By early 1865, Jefferson Davis sent three peace commissioners to Virginia to hold a conference with me and Secretary Seward. During the meeting, I made it clear that peace could only be achieved through the restoration of the Union and the acceptance of the 13th Amendment. Although I offered compensation to Southern slave owners, the Confederate president flatly rejected these terms, and the war continued. Confederate forces neared their breaking point as Sherman marched northwards through the Carolinas, and Grant defeated Lee at the Battle of Five Forks. Then on April 3rd, Union forces captured the Confederate capital of Richmond. The following day, I visited the city, where I was warmly greeted by throngs of freed African Americans who hailed me as the Great Emancipator. I returned to Washington on April 9th, and to my joy received news that General Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. The subsequent firing of 500 cannons spread the news of the Confederacy's defeat in the jubilant capital celebrated the end of the most devastating war in American history. While Congress had been a stronghold of opposition during my first term, my triumphant re-election and the continued Union victories facilitated greater cooperation between myself and the legislative branch. In this spirit, I urged Congress to pass the 13th Constitutional Amendment, which would prohibit slavery across the entire nation. I also emphasize the establishment and protection of the voting rights of African Americans. Many believe that had I overseen the Reconstruction process, the rights of Southern African Americans would not have been violated as they were in the years to come. They believe that the process would have been free from misgovernment and political division. Nevertheless, I was not able to oversee the healing of the country that I had done so much to save. On the evening of April 14th, while attending a play at Ford's Theater, I was shot by John Wilkes Booth, a Maryland actor and Confederate sympathizer. The bullet entered the back of my head, and after many hours of unconsciousness, I, the 16th President of the United States, passed away at 7.22 a.m. On April 15th, 1865, Edwin Stanton, my Secretary of War, who was present at my death, raised his head and announced, He belongs to the ages. Abraham Lincoln is widely regarded as the greatest president in the history of the United States. I entered office during the nation's most significant crisis and left having saved the Union, abolished slavery, and inspired the country. Moreover, I left behind words that have resonated throughout history. I led the United States with purpose and vision, always seeking acceptable political means to achieve my goals. However, there has been criticism of the extensive executive power accumulated during my presidency, as well as the suspension of public liberties during the conflict at my request. Additionally, my image is often tarnished by the fact that I oversaw the most brutal and bloody conflict in American history. Nevertheless, today I am primarily seen as the great emancipator who guided the United States through its most terrible crisis. I reminded the nation and future generations of what they were fighting for and the ideals upon which America was founded. Just like the soldiers I so memorably commemorated at Gettysburg in 1863, I gave my life so that the nation could continue to exist. 